Hello and welcome to A Critical Dragon, where I talk about narrative in film, television, and books. And today I am joined by my good friend Ian C. Asimont. Cam, how are you doing today? Hello. Hello. Thank you for the invite, AP. Always glad to, to chat. <laughs> no, it, admit it. I force you into these things. <laughs> no, you are kind enough to offer up your his, your experience and your insights and, and to want to share it all. So, Well, I thought like, of interest to both of us, obviously, the is the fantasy genre, but the impact of gaming <clears throat> on on fantasy how how gaming and the approach to gaming changed fantasy literature in different ways and even how other strands non-traditional strands of thinking about the fantasy genre and fantasy literature how there are influences that quite often are i hesitate to say prejudice but our bias is always toward, oh, let's look at the literary influences. Because, you know, we trace those all out and we forget that there are other narrative media and other narrative influences that <laughs> have come into play. And at least to me, and in my opinion, have had significant impact, particularly with, with fantasy writing. So, you know... I've I've talked to you before, ad, ad, possibly ad nauseum, about, <laughs> about my theories. So why don't we start with like, what are your general opinions on this? And we'll see to see how this goes. Mm -hmm. uh, well, what we uh, spoke about was, um, of course, the Fellowship of the Ring, the the Ring books, and the uh, influence more broadly Tolkien esque influence on on the following. <clears throat> decades of uh, fantasy writing as a genre. Uh, and then within that, um, the response of the gaming, which m most, you know, the, the big elephant is D&D um, &D and how G Gygax and, and um, really based much of it on, of course, the Tolkien universe. And so much so that infamously, he actually was sent cease and desist orders from the estate and told, not, you can't use the word hobbit, you can't do this, can't do that, etc. Uh, and that's how closely his um, game, <clears throat> the, the uh, content of it, followed uh, Tolkien's books. Well, because uh, it was Ents became Trance, um, the halflings, or the hobbits became halflings. Which became halflings, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, and there was, they even had to change. They had Balrogs, and then a Balrog then was. They had to change the type of demon, and it, it temporarily slipped my mind. But, but from a, so from a content perspective, you know that that obviously, if if you look at Appendix N, where Gygax and Arneson list a lot of the fantasy works that heavily influenced them, you know, Tolkien's Tolkien's one of the main ones. Well, the main one, in the sense that if you are, say, setting out to, to game in the um, RPG fashion and you are have a party, a group, you are sitting off into a Tolkien-esque world if you're following classical AD&D. A right? See, I, I disagree with that because we had, we had quest narratives pre-Tolkien. Mm -hmm. um, you, you had the Arthurian quests. Um, you had the whole entire picaresque tradition. Um, the, the idea of a quest narrative or even a quest group or people going on a, an adventurous travel log, like that has been in folklore and folktale at uh, time immemorial. Yes, I'm talking content again, still here, just just content. Yeah, and, and that, right. so more, more broadly, though, um, yeah, I mean, you can even staying within the games, gaming as a system. Um, Originally, it was called Chainmail, I think was the system. Yeah. And that was based on war gaming, more classically, which is the reenactment of classical battles, medieval battles, up to World War II battles. And it's a set of rules, tabletop, you know, um, with figures. And every figure has a role to play, like there's the archers, infantry, cavalry. So every 
individual group, if you will, a group or individual has a role to play, has a purpose, uh, as in the subject that they're representing, warfare. Yeah. And then in a in the party, everyone has a role as well. Uh, yeah, and so, but it's like when we think about this. So you can go back to what was it, the nineteenth century Kriegspiel, the the Prussian military training tool. And then H.G. Wells was so taken with it, he made a game, I think it was called Little Wars, which was a, um, a ludic version of the military training tool to teach tactics about moving them around on a battlefield and how far could cavalry move in a single turn and how far could infantry move in a single turn. And working all of these things out, that was a military training tool. And H.G. Wells was so taken with it, he created a game. And I think it was called Little Wars. And then from that, there was the uh, almost like the, the entire industry of these military games started. And you're exactly right that you had these figures representing um, a, a set of units. And Gygax and Arneson built on that to create hero units. So... And you could see that's drawing very much on a lot of the fantasy traditions that they they had read, where it was, you know, the hero, Achilles or That's Hector. The question there is, as you mentioned. Yeah, but <clears throat> Achilles or Hector, they were worth 10 men, 50 men. And, you know, applying that mathematical sort of modeling to it, you can you can see the attraction of that. But when when we get into, oh well, it's it's all based on Tolkien and and the creation of the party and going on a quest. So many, like Mary and Pippin, although there are different narrative events occur involving them, they don't have specific qualities that set them apart the way that in modern role playing, we, we talk about class and role within a party. Yes. Because, I'm not saying it originated there, but it's just, it's very much popular, popularized. Yeah. <clears throat> um, and um, not only then, do like, of course, in the game, the, the characters can only move so far, their attacks have such and such an effect, and everything's quantified uh, and, and, you know, and, and ideally balanced. Um, but, but that's just one aspect of, of the, the ludic elements that we're talking about. Because, and then if you, and I know you, when we spoke, you sort of criticized the, the Tolkien party as having... For useless members. <laughs> a wizard who uses a sword. And you know, not, not very efficient um, use of resources. But there's also the whole gaming um, riddle playing aspect of it, right? Which just permeates the, the works. Um, there's the of course the famous riddle battle between uh, Bilbo and Gollum in uh, <laughs> uh, all, Hobbit. The Hobbit, all of his works have these um riddle playing uh, games so there's 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 other aspects yeah and well this actually this came up during my phd because i wanted to call uh literature that evolved and used ludic elements i wanted to call those ludic narratives and i was told i wasn't allowed to because a ludic narrative was a narrative that contained the game. So The Hobbit was being classified as a ludic narrative because there were word games in it. And I'm like, but The Hobbit isn't a ludic narrative. It is a narrative with, with a ludic section. Ludic element. A, a ludic element included. But what I was talking about, the choose your own adventure books, that is a ludic narrative. It is both game and narrative. Um, and then we see the influence on a lot of the, the franchise tie-ins for all of the different D&D properties, like Greyhawk and Ravenloft and Forgotten Realms and Dragonlance. That in it, uh, Dragonlance in particular, Raistlin, um has, he's like, a, I think he's a level three wizard at the beginning. And you can count the number of spells that he uses and work out in in that opening sequence you can work out how many spells he has left because they're using the rules of the game and then every night Raceland has to rememorize the spells just like you did in the game because it was set in a game world according 
to game rules. And fast forward to today, when people talk about magic systems, people don't talk about magic in fantasy anymore. They talk about magic systems yeah. in fantasy. Yeah. You know, that is entirely due to gamification, to yeah. the ludic just, influence. The, the infamous... Um... <clears throat> separation into hard and soft magic systems and um the hard being what you're talking about very applicable to games quantifiable and then um you have this what could you call a subgenre of fantasy and science fiction books that are um problem solving books that you you um and the magic you have to figure it out and that's the goal of, of say in fantasy or in SF there's a particular physical law that's being explored and has to be discovered and played with um, so that is a, a game um, puzzle solving right uh, and the the hard system lends itself to that much much better yeah and but that's why. Because when people talk about hard and soft magic, you know, because we talk about hard and soft SF, and even then it's not a particularly useful distinction the vast majority of the time, because the distinction was made, hard SF was dealing with extrapolation from the physical laws as we understood them, the principles of yeah, physics as we understood them. Uh, some sort of a physics problem or a, uh, a thought experiment on a physical law, and that was the centerpiece of, of that particular work and soft well there's far less respect for actual well, physics <laughs> or or and this this is where it all starts to fall apart when someone is using the soft sciences you know like sociology psychology and and all of these things you go right so there's an over privileging of the sort of the mathematical approach and the physics approach and a lack of privileging for any other approach that isn't sort of this concrete mathematics based repeatable uh, i can program it kind of approach and that's why a lot of the distinction about hard and soft is it's not looking at how the thing is being implemented and why it is being implemented and what effects it is meant to be addressing it becomes well does it have that thing or not and people focus on the inclusion of the thing rather than whether it has been done well and for what purpose it was in uh, incorporated because well, and, you know, there's out out and out artistic license as well like lightsabers you know it just it's like well, but, how the hell does that work doesn't matter but, <laughs> it just well, looks when, great <laughs> but people go out of their way to explain the physics of lightsabers to yeah make... after the fact now yeah it's... and and we forget, like, no, it was like they are magical knights with so magical swords and magical powers. So they're space wizards with swords. That's that's what the Jedi were in Star Wars and New Hope. Like they were space wizards with swords. But now, because of the um, expansion of Star Wars lore and history and all of the franchise tie-in novels and all of the subsequent films and TV shows and cartoons that it has been built out and built out. And then you find retconning, retrospective changes to the canonicity in order to try and smooth things out and make it a real world, a real reality mm -hmm. um, where these things could physically occur because apparently that's important. And yet, <laughs> when when you think about it, it is just as fictional and just as unreal as a story set in fairy. Yeah. And but we don't have the same expectation of fairy that it conform to the physical laws of our universe in order to be an engaging story. A fairy can. I can't remember. There was a book that I, I read and in it they were walking along and they came to the border between one land and fairy and the next and suddenly like the rules of the world just completely change because they move from one realm to another realm portal novel sorry like a portal novel yeah but each each realm in fairy was its own fifth yeah that's yeah there was witch land 
Land of the Witches, Fairyland, Land of the Fairy, and then there was you know, et cetera, et cetera. And they each had their own physical laws. And but we, we don't look at that and go, no, but you need to have an underlying principle for all of them. No, it it's not. It's a it's a fictional construct. But as soon as we there seems to be, particularly with science fiction, oh well, you're flying through space with technology, therefore it must be understood in this way. And there's no must be understood in this way applied to it. It's fiction. If the narrative wants to do that, if they're trying to create that sense of a secondary reality and they want to do that, then sure, we want them to do it consistently. But so if we wanted to, um, like there is, there's Star Wars RPGs, right? Role-playing games. So you have to quantify things for, for, for the game. Uh, and um, so there we have an, an impetus in, in certainly from, from the gaming aspect. And once you've codified it in whatever, like the number of uh, games based on the Lord of the Rings, there, there have been a lot of ludic adaptations of the Lord of the Rings material. And because of that, there is almost like it becomes a general approach. And of course, Tolkien's yeah. work was so phenomenally uh, impactful and widespread and popular that people spent years codifying things and creating encyclopedias and bestories and all these different approaches and, and looking at everything and teasing it all out as if it was real. And all, all we have to do is we look at the Silmarillion and we look at the, the tales and the histories of Middle Earth, all of these posthumous books to see, no, it wasn't consistent and cohesive. It, there was a whole fragmented uh, multiple versions of the same stories that played out in different ways. Things that get introduced in one story that never appear again because mythic, mythic. It yeah. was myth, and Tolkien, Tolkien was continually tinkering with it and playing with. It, it wasn't finished. It wasn't a finished. Everything lines up. You know, <laughs> it, none of it lines up. It, it parts parts of it almost line up. When we start thinking about like Aragorn as a ranger, and he's walking around with the shards of a sword, not even an actual sword. <laughs> and we if if you put that in a modern fantasy novel, personally, I think the expectation of a reader would be, well, they might be carrying that around, but they'd have a like a, a an actual sword to use in case it's they cool. needed it. <laughs> you know, the family heirloom that's been shattered, okay, you're carrying it with you because you don't want to leave it behind, but also sword that you would use. <laughs> so the gamification, if you will, then is this um, movement towards um, so-called hard magic systems. And then the so-called soft side gets, uh, is, is being um, sort of pushed aside. It's a more traditional approach, more um, mythic, uh, more magical. I, and, you know, I don't mind there, there being these, like, you can see strength and, and weaknesses to both approaches. The, the thing that kind of rubs me the wrong way is when the hard approach, this rule-based approach, this mechanical materialistic approach is held up as the gold standard <clears throat> and... Any approach that doesn't do that is then denigrated. Uh, so, you know, in a fairy tale, it's, oh, they you've freed the, the animal and it turns out the animal was magical and offers you three wishes. Well, how does, how does the animal talk? Where, where are these three wishes? What are the limitations on the wishes? All of these rules need to be established. You go, no, they don't need to be established. Yeah. If that animal had wishes, why didn't they use it to take the thorn out of their paw? <laughs> and... And in part, I think a lot of this, if we think of the prevalence, even if someone doesn't play a lot of computer games, computer games have become so prevalent that it's influenced a lot of writers. And because it's influenced writers, then readers who don't play computer games are unknowingly being exposed, I think, to a lot of computer game logic and computer game rationale and computer game philosophy in the creation of these worlds and, and this approach. 
because in a computer game, you have to understand the consequences in order to, to perform the act. You have to know that if you hit a certain sequence, this thing will happen. It will cause X amount of damage or X to Y range of damage. You need to be able to calculate those things. They need to be repeatable. You can't sort of go, well, I'll do it and maybe it'll work. It might, or, oh, I just did this thing and suddenly this weird thing happened and everyone died and I won and I don't know what I did. Computer games require mastery. You have to be predictable. They have to know beforehand exactly what's, what the effects will be. True. Mm -hmm. And because that, my, my argument would be because that has become such a, a predominant mode of thought that that influences writers. Writers then who want to write novels, but because of the influence of these computer games, which were heavily influenced by the role-playing games that they now write almost with that philosophy in the back of their head that we must master these things. We must understand the rules. We must understand how and why the things are repeatable and that when you perform this sequence of actions, the same thing happens every time. Whereas we look at Gandalf. What are Gandalf's magical powers? I don't know. In the books. And, you know, we, we see he can make his staff light up. So, oh, he's, he's mysterious. He's very mysterious. <laughs> he can make his staff light up. He can set fire to pine cones. Um, he can make the illusion of horses appear on the waters of the foaming waters. Yes. <clears throat> he, um, he has the power to inspire. You're like, Right. But what are his actual magical powers? If he can create illusions, why isn't he creating it? Like he made the illusion of the horses on the, the uh, waters at the, the river. Why, why doesn't he use illusion magic then? Oh, um, reasons. Maybe he wasn't that good a player. <laughs> and I think you can very easily see when we, we get to fiction in the 80s and uh, fantasy fiction in the 80s and the 90s, that we have Gandalf-esque figures. Mm -hmm. But the type of magic they wield is A, far more overt, B, far more detailed and specific in its limitations. And it, it's almost as if there was a, this feeling, oh, no, but it would be really cool if we actually understood how the powers worked. But we didn't need that for the Lord of the Rings. So when people say, oh, the Lord of the Rings has, has influenced all these things, you go, but only only in certain ways. In, in content and appearance and in various other ways, yes. Yeah, the creation of the secondary world. It, <laughs> Tolkien took a fantasy world, but it wasn't ours. Even though there are suggestions in the text. Stuff. There are suggestions in the text that it is our world. And yet, his sort of creation of the whole thing it there's a mythic creation it's the a new myth of the creation of the world this new world that exists and its geography isn't the same and then you go well what about barzoom but that's oh but that was on mars and that's in our our solar system so that's not the same you go, but so you're saying that those cities on mars are exactly the way that uh burrows i would i would you know, I'm more generous. I would apply a secondary world to, to Barsoom. Well, so would I. I, I think, like, Burroughs did it. Um, True History by Lucian. Visiting the moon. That's a secondary world narrative because it, it's invented an entire nation and structure and weird creatures on the moon. But we see a lot of that develop in science fiction and far less of it in fantasy if we... Don't include things like fairy mm. and the underworld. Or, or horror in and classical literature as well. Uh, I'm thinking about Poe in particular, uh, like the strange narrative of Arthur Pym. Uh, and, you know, like a whole suggestion of a hollow earth and, and, and another world. You know? I, but hollow earth stories and the, the lost land tales, like they're, they're an articulation of the same thing. And a lot of it, I think, goes back to 
uh, portal quests and portal fantasies and travel logs to strange faraway places where mythic and legendary things could occur because so it was far away. We've taken, we've returned to fairy where you are wa lost in the woods and suddenly you stumble into a circle of mushroom ring or something and you are transported into the realm of fairy or you're taken uh, to the land of fairy. Or Odysseus and the <laughs> island of the Cyclops or uh, Circe's island. Uh, the, these are strange, wonderful places. And, you know, people people have poured over maps and mapped out what the uh, Ulysses... Possible route, yeah. yeah. The possible route and what islands they were actually referring to. You, know, mm -hmm. you, you don't think that maybe there was a bit of artistic license here to go... Yeah, you know, yeah. there's really good stories, yeah. But I... Um... Or even something that you can't point to on the map, like uh, Gilgamesh journeys to the land of the dead. Like it's an actual physical place that he goes to, and same for Orpheus. And so, you know, you can't point to it on the map, but they've en they've entered another world, but it's still you know in contact with our world. And with all of these things, like, with those earlier stories, there was no need to justify the rules and mechanics behind these fantastical places. Sometimes the, the character could work something out about a clever thing that happens there. You know, learning the importance in fairy of being very careful about what you say because promises carry weight in fairy that they don't necessarily carry in the human world. You know, but that's language magic, which has been been around We're working out the rules right again rules there are rules you just have to find them but and that's i think things really changed with rpgs and with then the computer game variants because computer games because it functioned on mathematics rpgs were the natural thing to port across and repeatable executable actions that were the same every time you did it or you know you could build in that the damage level increased as your level increased and so well, expectations have changed readership expectations have changed and so if if something happens and it just you know there's no reason it just happens that's unsatisfactory that does not you know uh, solve the issue anymore you can't just sort of but, but it's so strange. Why? Why? Why must it be that way? <laughs> um, we used to, and I suppose maybe we used the sense of wonder and the sense of wonderment to go, because it was awesome and it created this sense. And we have become a very jaded and cynical society, and therefore the sense of wonder is harder to achieve. Sense of wonder doesn't cut it anymore. <laughs> But when I think of um, like uh, Quad Keep, the Andre Norton book, which was the first D&D &D book, and it was the players from this world playing a game arrive in the world of Greyhawk, I think it is, and they have bracelets with polyhedral dice attached to them that anytime they attempt to do an action, roll and change and bring up the number. And that determines whether or not the action succeeds. They are in their game. And, you know, the never-ending story where we had the, the fictional fantasy world and the child outside the fictional fantasy world and then the interaction between the two. You know, this bleeding between narrative levels. But the expectation now, secondary world must be materialistic, must have all of these things explained as if it was an executable computer game. You, it's fine to do, but it... I don't think it should be the only way to approach something because there's a wealth of other approaches. But, but people, as you say, readership, they, they, um, they have their expectations to become used to a certain approach uh, and have been um, tutored, as you point out, by their computer game playing to, to approach it in that fashion. Uh, and so <clears throat> um, exposure to other approaches and then is 
something that can be pushed. Um, now that's earlier um, lit. And it can be a, um, a heavy slog because uh, not only have has content rules changed, but styles has mm. changed. <laughs> um, a- anyone who opens up a Dickens can will tell you that and they'll just say, oh my God, they look at these huge paragraphs of description uh, and you just can't push their way through it anymore. And I, I think Microsoft did a, a study back in, it might have been about 2015, I, Time Magazine, I think, reported on it. And it was, they, they said that the average human attention span is now 8.5 seconds. <laughs> in yeah. the Western world, perhaps. Right? In, in the West. And they, the same study suggested that goldfish attention span was nine seconds. <laughs> oh, now, dear. I, I could be misremembering the study, um, but it's, it's one of those things that floats at the back of your head. And I think, you know, the impact of media and technology has impacted the style of writing because writing styles have changed over time. We don't look at a 17th century novel or 17th century writing the same way 18th century, 19th century. We see evolutions and shifts and changes over time. And even within those different periods where we might outline a general movement, there are always going to be exceptions and things done differently. Yeah. And as you pointed out elsewhere, um, <clears throat> authors respond as well. You know, they, they, there are those who know what the market can, you know, what works in the market, what doesn't, and will feed to that market. Or things that impress them that they loved and they wanted to try their own hand at regardless of whether or not there were market influences making it a popular choice that you know art, artists and let's face it authors are artists um are not always influenced by the the most economic decisions no it's a mix it, but like all artists trying to survive and trying to live and thrive in our world that you know, you, you try to balance the economic tensions against the artistic tensions. And even that's not a true dichotomy because you can have both. Um, but I, I think it's fascinating that the, the ludic aspect, this idea of concrete rules, but not only are they concrete rules, they're concrete rules that are made apparent to the reader. And they can be built upon as long as there is a system in place that allows for... Uh, extension and refinement over time and you can keep doing that in a series as long as you don't contradict one of the other rules and then you'll find in a series it'll be oh yes but you can contradict the other rule because this rule allows you to contradict that rule which is what we saw in in terry goodkin's sort of truth series oh, where dear, it was like dear. the the wizard's sixth rule allowed him to overrule the wizard's second rule and then Oh, and then this this is a subset of that rule, which, ah, you know what? I can just do whatever I want. Mm-hmm. Is basically what, what the sort of truth descended into. Yeah. Um, well, you know, when you get into a corner, you <laughs> you have to get out of that corner. <laughs> and, you know, if you've, but if you've set out to create a very concrete reality that way, a very mechanistic, uh, defined reality that way, then yes, those contradictory rules will will appear and quite often should appear as uh, weaknesses because it's not conforming to what has been created. But if you set out to create a softer world that doesn't necessarily have that focus on the concrete reality, then contradictions within it, inherent contradictions within it, is not necessarily a failure or a weakness to the thing. It's it's part of what maybe is being played with. Well, it's, it's and, not, and, an it's, it's not a, a particular a goal. It's, it's not something that is trying to be um, uncovered by, by the narrative. You know, it's not the, the, <clears throat> it's not the uh, chest at the end of the quest, right? It's not part of that at all. So it doesn't matter what the rules you know, exploring the rules is, isn't even being um, done. It's not, that's not the goal. And I wonder how much of this is an extension of 
what we saw in a lot of children's fiction into young adult fiction, where because of the younger reading age, things had to be made more apparent and more overt in order to explain the differences in how the things functioned. And there was a more didactic approach in a lot of, of children's and young adult fiction. It was um, it like moral, like moral tales and um, well, sermon. Moral tales, but also the placing, um, placing heroes and adventures and things in schools where they can learn their skills because that's attractive to readers because it's a familiar environment. And if you've placed a story in a school where there are going to be rules explained about how something functions, then th that has to be of necessity consistent in the world consistency hmm. um yeah well a lot of the really older um uh, folk tales kids you know kids stories as, as they're some uh, told now but they weren't really at the time yeah. uh you know no one bothered to ask well why is there an old woman in the woods who eats children like what's she doing there and <laughs> like, how did she make her house out of gingerbread where was yeah. she getting all of the supplies? How would that work? Um, hang on a sec. This is happening in, in this part of Germany. Did Was there a lot of root ginger in, in supply at that time? Well, right. that's anachronistic. You can't have that. Well, did she travel to India? <laughs> and again, I just it, it seems strange that we have moved away from the acceptance of the fantastic as an element that can be fantastic and not explained to now needing it rationalized. And I think a lot of that has to do with, with gamification, with the, the ludification, ludic meaning, you know, of a game, ludo game, but ludic. And I think we're, and, and losing, perhaps losing something along, along the way. Yeah. And it just, it strikes me as a very significant change that has happened in the last 40 years, which, you know, in, in literary timescales is yeah. fairly quick. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, because like, even we were, we were talking to a mutual friend about Tarzan quite recently, but we don't look at Tarzan and go, oh, well, hang on a sec. How did he survive? Well, that doesn't make any sense. Like, but they would just, or Mowgli. Oh, but the wolves would have just eaten them. Well, they didn't eat Romulus and Remus. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, we look at that and, and say, but how are we meant to believe this? Oh, oh, and he can communicate with all these different animals. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he is somehow uh, speak uh, just, just with, the, you know, the chimps. You can learn that. <laughs> well, in Tarzan, it was the great imps. Because they the, weren't he, the gorilla, yeah, and they were a special type. They weren't even ordinary ones. But it, you think of how how strange it is that, um, you know, even looking at something like Starship Troopers with Heinlein, well, they're bugs, and you know, we don't like bugs because we're humans, and therefore they they should be eradicated, and it's like. Okay, but can we see that there are analogies being made? That it, it's not an allegory, but there are analogies that can be made between um, like a far right authoritarianism versus communism, and or they're both, if you will, yeah. and they're both pushed to extremes. Or we look at George Orwell's Animal Farm, and you go, it's an animal fable that just so happens to be an allegory as well, and political commentary. But you don't look at it and go, huh, it's really strange that all of these animals can talk, but the dogs can't. <laughs> and they can talk to each other. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But the guard dogs can't talk to the other animals. Well, why not? All the animals on the farm can talk. Well, that's Orwell was really bad at world building. He didn't understand how the rules. <laughs> that work. is not consistent. <laughs> You know, when we think about it, we don't think of that as a deficiency in Orwell's creation. But mm -hmm. if we were going to be consistent in our own approach of insisting on consistency in 
these fantastical creations, we would have to say that that is a failure on Orwell's part, mm -hmm. even though the book isn't meant to be exploring that. The book clearly doesn't care about that. And that is not relevant to what was trying to be communicated. So we can see that that's not a failure in so much as it it wasn't necessary. So it wasn't included. Yeah, it wasn't necessary. It wasn't an expectation. Um, so one of the consequences then of this um, <clears throat> rule based consistency explanation, maybe in fantasy then is this idea of world building. World building is the goal, right? And they would say, oh, well, he's built a magnificent world in this fantasy, and we're going to now, it's going to be revealed to us. Uh, and in world building, what, what are the priorities? The priorities are rule consistency, right? Et cetera, et cetera, like a little mini game. Right. But you, I happen to know, are uh, a specialist in travel logs of a particular kind, but wasn't a travel log in essence, an exploration of a foreign place to recreate it. And each place could be distinct with distinct rules. <clears throat> oh yes, definitely. Uh, that that's the whole, each, each one is unique, but internally true. Like in Gulliver's travels, when he's in the floating world of the scholars, every one of them had their flapper follower uh, so the hitting them so that they could you know be shocked out of their deep thoughts that they were uh, sinking into all the time. And yet, you know, we don't look at Gulliver's Travels and go, yeah, but that whole society would never function. <laughs> okay, it's not realistic. <laughs> right. That's not very. Where's the economy here? What's their mode of exchange? <laughs> really, it's Gulliver's Travels isn't realistic, huh? I wonder if it's potentially satire. Hmm. <laughs> well, okay. In a tra yeah, a travel log, a lot of times it was you were um, attempting to introduce your audience to a foreign world, and so you would take steps to try to normalize and explain these strange uh, customs and uh, creatures you know so you would make you see well it's kind of like a donkey but it's sort of a half zebra half thing and and you using a familiar language and familiar images that those back in your, your audience would, would, would know and so you're you're actually kind of you're translating in a way really is what you're doing and of course that's one of the approaches that we see in fantasy that it's this translation of a secondary world or reality into a way that is familiar to the reader. And, and yet, we, we know that this is an approach that a lot of people take. And we still have people go, oh, but they shouldn't have used that word in English because that word in English has <laughs> historical right. connotations. You're like, right. Almost every single word in the English language has historical connotations. It's called yeah. etymology. Be it, be it French or Greek or Latin, you name it. The, these words all came from somewhere. Um, and there has to be a balance between the two. And the idea that you cannot use a word that comes from a myth or historical event in in our world, in that world. Mm -hmm. it's, it's personal preference and also personal knowledge that quite often guides whether we trip up on that. Because someone can point to fascism as a relatively modern, modern coined political term. Go, well, you can't refer to fascists in a fantasy world. Why not? If that's what the thing is being described as, if that's what the thing is that is being described, then why not use fascism? Because that's the word that the reader is going to understand. Um, yeah, and similarly, uh, like describing something immense as Titanic. Or you know, cyclopean. It's like, well, you, oh, wait, that's Greek myth. You can't use that in your other fantasy world. You're no, we're not in Greek mythology here. And, so. <clears throat> and we again, we have very arbitrary lines that we draw between these things because you don't then refer to you look at a fantasy world as oh, he's using an epe. How can he be using an epe? Oh well, sorry, I'll, I'll just change that to rapier. Oh, a rapier is it? Oh, now, now. 
<laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> because if if you know where all of these swords originated in the history behind them and the history behind the names, you're going to have the same reaction to that that someone else might have to political terminology or biological terminology or archi um, architectural terminology like Cyclopean. But it all depends. And you could so what what is the option? Oh well. Avoid all words that anyone might possibly know the etymology of. <laughs> you'd be you'd be left with a pretty short list of words. <laughs> you know, guest and hostage and host all are etymolog etymologically derived from the same root. Now, oh well, we we can't use any of those then mm -hmm. because that's very specifically from. Yeah, no. The, there, there has to be a blend. And people say, oh, but it, it's clear. An Achilles heel, you can't use Achilles heel because that's a very specific thing. But where is that dividing line? Yeah, yeah. That is, and, it has to fall. And it falls in different places, as you say, for different individuals. Some people, are, they, they don't care. They'll, they'll understand that it's just uh, an attempt to translate something into so that you know the full effects. And, but other people might just be very literal minded and say, no, you can't. That's... Achilles does not belong here. And to, or describing something as vampiric. And you go, oh, do vampires exist in this world now? <laughs> yeah, they don't exist in our world. <laughs> True enough. <laughs> <clears throat> or do they? Hmm. Well, I've met some academics who uh, are, look suspiciously young. I've, I've met some pretty pale people. <laughs> <laughs> Watch it, you. Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, so, um, rule, expectation, consistency, and literal mindedness, these all sort of go together. And, and what's being lost is, um, magic. Magic and subtext and implied meaning and hidden meaning and the analogies and the symbols and... All, all of that stuff that and playfulness yeah. um but i think one of the the other things that comes up fight sequences the idea <laughs> of fights and i think both computer games but also hollywood and and tv and film have done enormous damage to the idea of fights in in fantasy world that these titanic clashes that last hours of people in really heavy armor with these heavy weapons bashing each other for hours on end. And when you think about it, it's, it's not particularly realistic. But it's an expectation. Oh, he hit me a few times, so my hit, my hit points are lower. Like, humans don't actually have hit points. This, this is a, a statistical calculation for a computer game or any sort of game to go, the number of wounds that you can take. You, know, you can take one wound and be dead. You can take five wounds and still be alive. It's it's the type of wound, not the, the yeah, number those, those, of wounds. Those blows did, did uh, only roll to one, so they were, they were well, very minor. <laughs> but, or the, the Black Knight in Monty Python and the Holy Grail. It's just a flesh <laughs> wound. It's a flesh wound, that's right. Go back and I'll bite your ankles off. But we have an expectation about these long drawn out fights where you know people blast away at each other and for the whole first part of the fight often you know they're, they're smacking each other but there's no discernible damage and then suddenly the tables will turn or there'll be this moment where now suddenly damage actually occurs and has effects and impact because we're building up to a, the, the climax of the fight and it's going to be resolved so we need to ratchet up the tension and, and show damage and then you know, a day and a half later, they've had a bandage on, but, oh yeah, their arm's fine. Because it's just an actor wearing a bandage over an arm that is not injured. But if that had been a, a real fight where they'd suffered those injuries, you that they're out of action now for a couple of days at least. It's, oh no, but we need them to do this scene. Yeah. So in games... But that, no, that, that sounds like a real limiting expectation of realism. All right, but 
that's not so much necessarily the expectation, even in a game system. Well, because you have healing magic and healing potions, and you take this thing and it gives you your energy back. Like, as if that's how biology works. But we <laughs> accept it as a mechanism within the thing because we go, even though it makes no sense whatsoever, there's a rule that is applied. And as long as it's applied consistent, uh, consistently, that's fine. Let's just hand wave over the fact that healing magic in almost every single fantasy ever written makes no sense. It just doesn't. <laughs> it's drink this healing potion. How does the potion know what to do and what not to do? Um, <laughs> the, it, well, all healing is kind of the same. You think, no, that, well, it, it well, gets complicated. Yeah, and, and that, of course, is, is um, a necessary compromise for the establishment of, of the game or, or the story. Like, you know, miraculous healing goes way back. Really? <laughs> but another thing that I, again, it, it's a, an impact from, I think, the gamification, the, the ludic influence. Um, because in the past, we wouldn't have gotten quite as hung up on elements like that. And yet now there needs to be an explanation for how they healed. And that is an expectation that readers have. How did they, how did they recover from, oh, they have two broken arms and, uh, you know, a day later they're, they're hobbling around and then uh, within a week they're back to training. You go, they they healed a broken arm and a broken leg in a week. That's impressive. Or it's they cast a spell and the bones knit back together. Do you know how excruciatingly painful that would be? Oh no, but it was magic. There, there was no pain. It just magically did it. Okay. So do they have a scar? Does anyone have a scar? Well, why not just use magical healing? Why why do why does scar tissue form? <laughs> if magical healing exists why do people go blind why do we have characters where there's magical healing wearing little glasses because they have bad eyesight you go they just need to take some of the magical healing and it will cure their eyesight and as soon as we start scratching at the surface of it that's what i mean by so many of these attempts to codify healing magical healing in these worlds fall apart because yeah, yeah. the the concept of how bodies heal and recover from trauma is really complex stuff. And there are a lot of interactions. So ultimately, the, the attempt to quantify as, uh, sort of falls apart, not, not only in, in um, he, examining healing, but in fighting or co confrontations, uh, violence and <clears throat> But I think that if if the um, the goal isn't necessarily to try and take it apart, I think the goal is to establish sort of a reassurance that there's something there uh, that they can use for uh, predictive purposes, like to to know what's going to happen. Yeah, I, and but even with that. If you think when we, when you watch uh, sporting events like boxing and everything is broken down into the stats of the individual boxers, their height, their weight, their reach, uh, their, the number of fights that they've won, the number of fights that they've lost, the, you know, all of this breakdown of stats so that people can calculate and work out who's going to win the fight before the fight happens. And then upset the one that wasn't meant to win won because it's a fight. And we think of how how so many of us approach what's so-and-so's power level? How would they do in a fight? Who would win in a fight, the mage or the warrior? You go, well, are they standing a mile and a half apart? Because my money be on the mage then. Because <laughs> the warrior's going to take time to get up to them. Um, if they're standing next to each other, my money's on the warrior. <laughs> because context matters. But the whole idea that we can turn it into a set of statistics that we then run through an equation and that will give us the answer. But 
That's not how fiction works. Who would win in the fight? Whoever the author wanted to win in the fight. Well, if whoever has to in order to forward the, you know, the goals of the narrative. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> because, but we're so used to that. Oh, well, you know, they're, they're stronger than them. They are faster than them. I'm trying to work these things out. But even with the appearance of these rules, and we see it with superheroes all the time. Um, the Flash is the fastest superhero in the DC universe, and he can run so fast he can go back in time. But then there are issues of Superman where Superman is just as fast as the Flash. And if the Flash is so quick as to be able to do that, then he is unbeatable. Because if he can move faster than the speed of light or close to the speed of light, then even with enhanced reflexes, he can move faster than anyone could react or anyone could set up a trap for him because he's processing information so quickly that you, you couldn't catch him. You couldn't defeat him. He would be undefeatable. And then, you know, oh, well, he has to eat so many calories a day because he's burning up all of his calories. And that occasionally gets brought in. But the, those numbers don't add up. <laughs> oh well it's because of a mystical speed force oh there's a lot right. a lot that it doesn't add up i don't i don't want to go into superheroes i know but but that's then it's well it's the mystical speed force and why do we use the term mystical because now we can hand wave away all of those things that don't make sense that don't so suddenly it became important to try and explain it right like only like you're saying in the last few decades Oh no, now we have to come up with something to explain this as people are wondering. <laughs> and you know, that's that's that change that I, I I try to or I think that games have done a lot. I think that change that we have seen in the last 40, 50 years, games have done a lot to create that. Because they are mathematically modeled. They are about consistent rules being applied all the way across. They are about if X happens, then Y is the result. Every time that X happens, then Y is the result. Repeatable, executable commands. <clears throat> that has become such a default that I think it has become a philosophy that permeates a lot mm. of storytelling, particularly in fantasy. And a lot of that is from games. At least I think so. Well, you know, there, there, we haven't spent a lot of time talking. We, we've we've rushed against uh, science fiction and, as an exploration of physical laws, and that's exactly what you're doing, right? Repeatable. If if X happens, then Y must happen in and in a very true physical sense, and that's exactly what that subgenre of SF does. So it's um, Hal Clements was it Mission of Mission of Gravity? Mission of Gravity, yep. Uh, trying to work out how strong the gravitational force would be, how large the planet would be, what its rotation would be to have the uh, centripetal force offset the uh, gravitational pull so that humans could survive. But obviously that would be what the declination in that force would be as you got closer to the poles and therefore just have the gravitational force. You know, working out all of those calculations, and it was a spur and a thing for him to explore in that story. And it gave him the impetus for story. And you go, that's awesome. But I don't have that same expectation about Barzoom. <laughs> or Star Wars. Mm -hmm. You know, TIE fighters. Screaming, and the, the ion engines that scream in space. Yeah, because they're evil. That's why they make the screaming noise. And then he and said, well, it was radio interference. <laughs> and yet there are sometimes when there are those moments that add that little droplet of authenticity to it that can really sell the more fantastical mm -hmm. elements as believable. And again, it's about, I think it's more about suspension of disbelief rather than realism. Realism. That's the artistry. That's the artistry of it. Yeah. Because if an author can help us as readers suspend our disbelief, 
it doesn't matter if it is realistic or unrealistic because generating a fireball between your hands, you go, do you understand the laws of thermodynamics? <laughs> Clearly not, because that is going to be emanating heat. Are his no, no, hands no, it's contained plasma? <laughs> uh, contained plasma that radiates heat. <laughs> not in a magnetic sphere. There is only. <laughs> or you know they're going to um a cold spell how does a cold spell work is it drawing heat from somewhere or like how is it creating cold right you know, as soon as you start going into the physics of it you're like mm, yeah let, let's not look at the physics of this it's uh, magic yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay so it doesn't have to be realistic what it has to be is enough to give a suspension of disbelief mm -hmm. Um, yeah. Some people, um, you know, are are they just fall right into that, and they're willing to go along with it and say, "Okay, fine, let's go for the ride." But other individuals have, you know, maybe higher uh, <clears throat> tolerance or whatever, or lower tolerance, whichever, and just uh, that that suspension doesn't come as as uh, readily or easily. Yeah, you know, a, a character who has the magical ability to fly. You go, did they magically get the ability to breathe very thin air? <clears throat> so, so they can fly. Awesome. How are they powering it? Oh, well, it's magical. Yeah, but how they fast? They have some warm clothes, too. Warm <laughs> clothes and an oxygen tank. And also, do they have an unerring sense of direction? Because I don't know about you, but if I suddenly develop the ability to fly like Superman, so I shot up into the air and then I'm like, Right, I need to, oh, hang on a sec. Let, let me get out my GPS to find out where I am going because I have not memorized the the entire map. To, oh, it's, it's, it's over there. Like if I wanted to fly from here to New York, right, I have to go low enough that I could follow the road. <laughs> <laughs> Stop every once in a while with a map. Because, Check your compass. But when we think about, when we think about the power to fly, be it magical or, or science fictional, that it seems to come with a whole host of these add-on powers that are just never mentioned, like unerring sense of direction, the ability to survive really cold temperatures, the ability to <laughs> breathe air you know. that has very little oxygen in it. But we don't... Well, that just... I don't believe in that. Yeah, we go with it. We we assume. Oh, so they have the ability to fly. They just get all those other things as well. <laughs> they don't don't even think about it. It's, yeah, okay, they can fly. All right, fine. That's, so it's it's not about realism. It's about giving us enough for suspension of disbelief, creating a sense of authenticity, because it's not realistic. Because someone flying. Where is the energy coming from? How much energy would they expend? So, in a in a fa some fantasy secondary world uh, novel series, then then that expectation of realism is out of place, even if it's self contained within that world. Is it? Yeah. Well, because I I get my problem with people applying realism is we never apply it universally to the text. It is always to selective elements within the text. And we ignore whatever particularly irked me. <laughs> yeah, yeah okay. we apply realism to that thing, but we don't apply it to the whole host of other things. Because, well, yeah, we like them, that we enjoyed them. Or, it, you know, it was kind of consistent with the rest of the world. You know, yeah, yes. that's and not realism. If you're going to apply realism, be consistent about it. <laughs> if you're going to apply consistency, be consistent about it. And I think so much of this is like people even talk about we want we want realism in computer games. You know, okay, so you want to play a shooting game that you can get one shot by the enemies before you even know they're there. Or you want to have you know a fantasy game that has realism and you go, so you take one hit from that sword and you're dead every time. A lot of those games would become incredibly frustrating that we don't mind the sense of fantasy that gets applied to make us more powerful and therefore have a chance to win even though it realistically it, it wouldn't happen that way um 
or you know in in action movies where they have an endless stream of bullets and an endless well, stream of cartridges yeah, this is the- why there's no superhero called accountants accountant man <laughs> okay <laughs> it's forensic accountant man no, he is the being of all superheroes. He's the the ultimate supervillain. He's a supervillain. <laughs> because he negates their powers. Right. Well, Super hang on a sec. That yeah. yeah. That's your and his ability is to uh sit down and do double entry bookkeeping for hours on end. Let's watch for four solid hours while numbers are added from one column into another column. Very realistic. <laughs> and enthralling to a very it's small percentage falling. of people. Oh, yes. And this is why, you know, it, it, it's why I don't necessarily like the term realism when we talk about this. Because realism is a, quite a specific thing. Uh, whereas authenticity... Modern, the modern expectation. Yeah. yeah, but authenticity locates what we are talking about within the diegesis because that's about an, a level of consistency or coherency within the diegesis rather than applying an external metric to it to say it must conform to right. our expectation so, of physics. So your preferred term is uh, authenticity. Yeah. Uh, you, the question is, is that is X authentic to the established secondary world or whatever? So that's a, a, a better um, <clears throat> metric. Than well, it, it's, it's a metric I prefer, and it's a metric I think is more useful. Because if someone says, is this realistic? And you go, no. But no, of course not. neither, neither <laughs> yeah. are any of the other elements. Those are not realistic either. <clears throat> I go, but they're realistic within the world. You go, no, but they're not realistic. They are authentic within the world. Um, But even with with that, there has to be, at least to my mind, a, a level of flexibility and mutability in our approach and in in assessing the execution, because an expectation that it is rigidly constructed, I think, is extraordinarily limiting, not only to the type of fiction we then enjoy, or the type of fiction that authors are going to be producing, <laughs> But it's denying us the pleasure of all of these other forms and approaches to storytelling and con- the engagement with storytelling. It, generally speaking, it, it works against the artistry, I, um, I think. It is too, uh, too limiting. Yeah. And, but you know, as, as an author, if someone sets you a concrete limit, this, this is something that authors do all the time. They go, I have this limit. And they suddenly create something amazing to get around it. To, oh, yeah. To- oh, yeah. We were talking about expectations, though. So. <laughs> um, and so it, it's not that authors, you know, should be completely and utterly unlimited. You know, they, authors can apply limits to their work and find ways to be playful with them. But the expectation that we externally as readers apply limitations to what authors can and cannot do or should or should not do. Yeah, limit. <clears throat> that, that is something that I, I, I'm, I'm not so happy with. <laughs> okay. Saying, I don't enjoy an author doing that thing. Oh, yeah, that's fine. That, that, that's about whether or not you like it. But saying an author should or shouldn't do it. They shouldn't do this thing. They shouldn't include that thing. Like, why not? Mm-hmm. And you can say, oh, well, in this instance, you go, oh, right. So you're talking about that specific author and that specific book and that specific instance. Okay. There's something to talk about there. But when it becomes the general argument about a thing and an art, there shouldn't be swearing <laughs> in pop music. <laughs> there shouldn't be nudity in film. There shouldn't be violence in computer games. There shouldn't be politics in writing. You're like, I've heard a lot of these arguments before. Usually, when people are talking about what books they're censoring, what books they are burning, what books they are banning, it is a true censorship stance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. (laughs) But do you think that games have impacted the genre 
Um, from a, a readership expectation, of, yes, uh, and, and an authorial approach as well. I mean, um, we're seeing authors writing fantasy uh, series where um, exploring the rules of the world has become you know, a real, uh, almost a subgenre. Um, and the, a lot of the readers are uh, applying what they um, uh, have seen in, in other media to the genre and are limiting themselves, frankly, in, in what they are uh, favoring or disfavoring. And I think as long as it's a choice, as long as it's something that an author is willing to choose, then you go, I don't see any harm in it. But <laughs> when it becomes felt that, no, it must be done this way, that's when I start getting really uneasy that, mm. that authors are being forced into a position where this is the only viable option or that no other option even occurs to them because we have collapsed down the potentialities <laughs> of fiction to yeah, such an extent true. because people have been saying, I, I just want that thing. And quite often we want that thing for a while. But our tastes change over time. And unless there are authors out there experimenting and doing different things, yeah, it's going to get, become get very the same stale. Meal, um, every day pr pr pretty quickly. Um, but then, you know, we're moving into even broader issues like um, publishing and, you know, and being able to get things to the audience. And, and uh, there's only so much, uh, so many publishing houses out there and the gate of entry is narrower from their point of view. And so um, the, the palettes are becoming monochrome and more and more beige to fit into that gate. I think, yeah, like in, in some respects, like traditional publishing, we're, we're down to how many major publishing houses do we now have? Is it three or four? Five? Is, is the, is five? Five major publishing houses who own everything. Something like that. And sorry, just in case people take me, they don't own everything. <laughs> Within the world of publishing. That was hyperbola, an exaggeration <laughs> for effect. Um, that the, there are fewer and fewer outlets for the diversity of approaches. In the traditional publishing world, now, now there's also, of course, self-publishing. Now, maybe that will save us this, you know, let a thousand flowers bloom sort of approach. And while self-publishing and independent publishing is amazing in encouraging diversity, it has also led to making things very hard to find. Because unless one of those books breaks out and suddenly everyone is like, how do you find it? Because they're now, yeah. when, when there were uh, the sort of the traditional publishers releasing their list of what was being published and there, there were certain names on it, it made it manageable. But now that there are thousands upon thousands upon thousands of titles being published every year, just in maybe even a subgenre of fantasy, trying to find those voices can mm. require a lot more effort on our part. And particularly when we used to be able to go and browse in a bookshop, fewer and fewer bookshops, because there are fewer and fewer uh, uh, owners of bookshops in that it, there are massive chains. And, and again, that's about reducing the number of corporations. There yeah, are fewer yeah. and fewer independent bookshops that will take a chance on stocking independent books. Yeah, I really miss that physical browsing. Um... And I think that I came upon all kinds of gems just just by looking down the shelves. Uh, and I, yeah, I really miss that aspect. Yeah, it was really convenient when I was buying the Malazan books because you and Erickson are so close together on the shelf. <laughs> that was an accident, complete, complete accident. Welcome. Um, Thank you very much for having this chat with me. I don't, we probably didn't talk about the thing that we intended to talk about, but. I think we, we were sort of rambled around the countryside rather, rather a lot. <laughs> Where 
Well, it's been one of those days. But thank you very much for joining me, Cam. Thank you, AP. And for those of you still watching, thank you very much for watching. Thank you for your continued support and see you in the next one.